The Process Podcast, breaking down the daily habits, processes, and tools of high achievers. Now, here's your host, Brad Wilson. Hey there, boys and girls. Welcome to The Process Podcast. This is your host, Brad Wilson. As always, if you haven't yet subscribed to my show, that would mean a whole lot to me. So please take a moment to press that little subscribe button. If you love this episode, I would be extremely grateful and appreciative if you could leave a review on however it is you're consuming this episode. On today's show, I have with me Victoria, or V.E. Schwab, who's an international best-selling creator of Engrossing Worlds. And what struck me first and foremost in my conversation with Victoria is that she has an enormous heart. The day that we had this conversation, I was less than 24 hours removed from a personal tragedy. I was emotionally fried, running on no sleep, and had a very real fear that my brain was going to stop working on me right in the middle of this conversation that I had been looking forward to for months. I took some time in our pre-interview to explain and apologize for what was going on, and she reacted with pure kindness, understanding, and empathy. So in addition to the fact that her books are incredible and more than worthy of your time and attention, the reason that I'll personally be a lifelong Schwablin and ambassador for her creations is because she's an amazing human being with a kind and generous heart. In our conversation, we discuss her process to continually improve and deepen the well in which she draws from in her craft, her method of regular self-care, how Neil Gaiman opened her eyes and blew her doors open to the many possibilities that exist for creators, how Vicious was the first book she wrote for herself, and how that changed everything about her creative process, and much, much more. So without any further ado... It's my absolute pleasure to bring to you my conversation with the extraordinary Victoria Schwab. Good morning, Victoria. How are we doing? Doing all right. Doing all right. Finished a first draft last night of a book, and so I'm feeling a little a little groggy in that strange aftermath headspace that tends to happen after you have been holding up a book-sized object in your head for a very long time, and then you finally get to set it down. Congratulations. So does this mean you get to take a little break? No. I mean, it's the best and worst part of my job. I have multiple publishers and multiple books kind of in development at the same time. And so I, I, as soon as I put this book down, maybe take a day, kind of get my thoughts together. I have another book that's due at the end of this year that I've been working on. And I actually go on tour for Vengeful next week. And so it's just a whole lot of like adulting and life preparation. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. Um, thank you for spending your one restful day here, here with me. I, I, I really appreciate that. It's my pleasure. So I, I want to start out, you know, you self-professed have a, an adversarial nature. Could you give me any first memories of that adversarial nature, seeing it in yourself? Well, so I'm an only child, and so I tend to run uh, naturally perpendicular to whatever expectations are as someone who kind of grew up entertaining myself, uh, kind of the god of my own little world far before I ever wrote fiction and became the actual god of my own little fictional world. I have very strong memories early on. I, I mentioned one on Twitter one day, and then my mom, of all people, retorted on Twitter and started posting other memories, but... Um, I was a very headstrong kid. If someone told me I couldn't do something, I would not just overtly rebel, but I would find the loophole in (laughs) in like the system. And I do remember I must've been like eight or nine and I got very ornery because my babysitter wasn't paying any attention to me. She was like watching television and talking on the phone. And so I very slowly began to, tie her to the chair she was sitting in but like oh my God. starting from the ground <laughs> up so she didn't quite notice it at first like and she noticed it and I mean look I was like eight I I wasn't great at tying knots but she got unsettled <laughs> enough by the experience that she then locked herself on the back porch and like called the neighbors and the best part of all of this is that 
She then didn't call my parents though. So my parents came home a couple hours later if she finally had like come back inside the house <laughs> and they asked how everything had gone and she was like, oh, it went fine. And then as soon as this babysitter left, the neighbor started calling to make sure that everything was okay. <laughs> and my parents were like, what on earth did you do? And I was like, nothing. Like we were just hanging out. Like we were just playing <laughs> games. My family was like always a little like if you told me like, be mindful or be good or don't like I would find a way to kind of circumnavigate that I started to become a lot more ornery about it when I was in my late teens I went to a really strict um, all-girls preparatory school in the south the kind of thing where you couldn't have dyed hair you couldn't have like your shoelaces undone you couldn't have any infraction would earn you Saturday school and I remember very clearly showing up for the first day of school with bright blue hair like just <laughs> bright blue hair and these shoes that were really popular at the time, these running shoes that like had no laces because they were slip on running shoes. So I got Saturday school, like the very first day of my freshman year of school. By the time I graduated, I, um, I chopped off all my hair. I got my first tattoo and I backpacked around Europe because I, my adversarial nature isn't just to do with other people. It's largely to do with myself. If I'm afraid of something or nervous about something, the only way that I know to combat that is really head on. So I had a fear of change. I had a fear of needles. I had a fear of like being away from family. And so these were my ways of kind of forcing myself forward and when I was a sophomore in college, I realized I was afraid of writing a book because I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of not being able to finish. And so that adversarial nature kicked in and I sat down and I wrote my first novel. Baptism by fire. Uh, exactly. What did the babysitter do to you? I'm so, I want to go back to the babysitter <laughs> story because she didn't actively come after you. you no, know? she ignored me. She just like ignored you child, and you wanted like, attention. not used to being ignored. <laughs> She just like wasn't entertained by me. And so I think my eight-year-old brain was like, oh, you wish to be entertained, mere mortal. I shall entertain what, myself, you know? What would you have done if you would have gotten her tied up? That's the, what was I mean, the plan? I got her pretty well tied before she noticed. I mean, she was like 14, 15, right? She's babysitter <laughs> age here. I didn't think it was all that menacing of an activity to do because I had spent years tying up my teddy bears. I made a torture chamber for a Barbie doll one time <laughs> using one of those like Play-Doh, like cut your own Play-Doh sets. Those mm -hmm. little like, looks like a little conveyor belt. I had amused myself for years. One of my very earliest memories my mom loves to tell is I was probably four or five and we had a two-story house. So the upstairs had a landing, like one of those landings with the little wooden railing and the bars. She came home one day to find me systematically executing every one of my care bears by like kicking them over the side. And I had tied their hands behind their backs. And so they were like hanging. So my mother comes home to see her like four or five year old, tiny little like blonde, blue eyed child, like <laughs> kicking, like basically like declaring each care bear sentence and just shoving them off and then there's just like a row of six care bears just hanging from the <laughs> stairs so I think that it's no surprise I think my parents are probably very relieved that I ended up a writer instead of like a serial killer yeah I was gonna say your, your parents are probably relieved with your uh, career path because they, they may choice. have had some concerns it's that choice of imagination my mom actually so my grandmother was really into occultism and had a prophecy read like over me when I was still in like in my mother's stomach. So before I was born and the prophecy essentially said, I'm reducing many pages down to a single line, but basically that I would have a way with words and that I would either become a storyteller or a cult leader. <laughs> and so I think my parents are just very, very relieved <laughs> that I went with Storyteller. Though considering how many of my readers now like get tattoos of my words, you, I, my parents are starting to worry <laughs> that it might have been like a little of column B as well. Yeah, the door's still open. You got time. Exactly. <laughs> um, can, can you tell me about, so Harry Potter, you, yeah. you've mentioned that it was the first book that you, you forgot where you were. Could you tell me how old you were and how getting lost in that series made you feel? So one of the reasons this is so important is like, I feel like I'm at odds with many, many writers with this answer because I was not much of a reader. I was, I was really proficient. Like I, I knew how to read. I, it wasn't a, an ability problem. I just was disinterested in everything that I read. And so 
Um, I was 11, actually. I'm that special age that when Harry Potter came out, I was 11 years old, Harry Potter's age. But I didn't, re- I didn't realize, like, I didn't find the books automatically. What actually happened is that a friend of the family called up, she was at a bookstore in Southern California, and she's like, hey, like, I know Victoria's not really into reading. I was a jock. Like, I was always playing sports, and so I just wasn't around very much. Um, I wasn't ever, like, really sitting around getting lost in that way. And she was like, but there's a woman here signing books and they look like they're for Victoria's age. Do you want me to get one for her? And, and so like what arrived in the mail the next week was a hardcover copy of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone signed by JK Rowling. Wow. Because that was the woman in this bookstore that you know, she <laughs> wow. was, this is the first book. This was her first time touring in the United States. And so she wasn't really a big deal yet. She was just in like a borders. <laughs> and so, um, I remember picking up that book and being a bit suspicious because what I was reading at that time was like, I had gone straight from boxcar children to like Robert Ludlum. So I was definitely hadn't really found an escapist place between the two. I kind of had just jumped into adult suspense and thriller. And I remember reading the first book in like a day, like a day or two. I just didn't want to move from my spot. And it was the first book that made the edges bleed out, like made me forget what I was doing in the way that when you're watching a film, you forget you're sitting in a movie theater and the movie theater disappears and you just see the the film, that that trick of the eyes. That's the first time I ever felt that with a book. And it it was a really, really formative experience. I I say that Harry Potter made me a reader and then um, Neil Gaiman made me a writer. So I think there's a bit of a, a gap there. I wasn't, I was really interested in storytelling, but I never wanted to like use pen and paper at that point. I just knew I wanted to tell stories. I didn't know what shape it would take. That's awesome. And I, I, I was much older when I first read Harry Potter. Mid, yeah. I think mid twenties. I, and, uh, I just, you know, fell into it. You know, it's yeah. one of those books that grabs a hold of you and doesn't let go. And I've read through it twice now. And every time I get through the seventh book, I mm-hmm. get sad yeah. that it, that it's all ending. And then I read the, the screenplay Mm-hmm. And I did not like the screenplay. So no, much. Uh, I will say though, I went, I've seen the play, and the play is so like the screenplay is such a disservice to the actual play. The play is really impressive and worth seeing, and the screenplay is. I'm a canonical uh, like Harry <laughs> Potter fan. Like I like for me, Harry Potter is concretely like books one through eight. Like it's it's just like just the or like books one through seven. It's just I, I break the movies in my head. <laughs> um, it's just the canon. It's just the the original series, and I think it's okay as the reader to create those delineations from your for yourself. Uh, I will never forget though. I was probably like fourteen, just when I was starting to realize I wanted to be a writer. So fourteen, fifteen, and I was walking. So the Harry Potter series was already running the book, still like halfway through, and I think the first movie had just come out. And I was walking through a park in Nashville and I, I heard two people talking about Harry Potter in like a very intense academic way. And I stopped and it was like two professors. And one of them was like an older dude in his seventies and one was like a middle-aged woman. And they were having the most in-depth analysis style conversation about the books. And that for some reason hit me in such a different way where I thought, I want to write something one day that makes people talk in that way. And specifically, like, this was a series that broke so many boundaries of reader, of perceived readership. Like, this was not the original audience. This was two, like, university professors having that conversation. I just thought, well, that's success right there. Do you think you've done that? I have in no your idea. books yet? You don't know? I have no I, idea. I, I definitely haven't have a, overheard anybody. Well, I have a really them. broad readership. And I have, like, I do know that some college students have used Vicious, for instance, as like an analytical text. They've read, 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 written theses on it, which I think is pretty cool. But I, I have no idea. I'm not sure that anybody ever gets that kind of window into their own audience. Maybe. Maybe one day. I think <laughs> J.K. Rowling just did, if she <laughs> yeah. ever, ever hears this. Um, so after Harry Potter... Um, you, you mentioned you were a jock and I'd like to talk about that. Are, do you, are you still a jock? Do you still like sports? I don't play any of them anymore. Mostly. So I played soccer for 13 years, um, competitively and I was competitive fencer for six years. Oh, wow. And, um, I still 
I, last year I trained a lot in fencing, but unfortunately, given my tour schedule, given my work schedule, I just, I haven't been able to dedicate the amount of time or energy needed to be a truly competitive athlete right now. Honestly, I'm lucky if given my tour schedule, I can get to a hotel gym several days a week or, or anything. I, I'm settling for a more holistic approach to health right now, given my work schedule. So I still, I miss it. I miss competing in that way every day and I miss the physicality of it, but it, it's something that it's probably one of the sacrifices that I've had to make for my own career. I see. So you're an undergrad, right? Yeah. When you, when you first decided to write your book, can you tell me about that process? And the, you know, you mentioned the adversarial nature that you yeah. didn't, you didn't, you were afraid you couldn't do it and that's what made you do it. Yeah. Um, so could you tell me, how did it feel when you got it done before <laughs> you, you know, for anything, just yeah. seeing the man, completed manuscript? I mean, it's addictive. It's the most addictive sensation in the entire world, finishing something that you've started. And it's not the end of the process. Obviously, you've made a thing. I think it's um, Shannon Hale has a really amazing quote about like you, the first draft is just creating sand for the sandcastle. Like you're just creating clay. You're just creating sort like base material to work from. And yet it is always a, a more feasible act to make something better than to make something from scratch. And so I, it was a sensation that I have then sought again and again and again, obviously. But I want to make sure that I say that book was not good. If this is my first book I ever wrote. It is not the book that launched my career. It was the first book that I wrote. And it was really uh, aesthetically attractive. It was very pretty on the word by word level because I had a really strong background in poetry. Uh, so I brought a lot of my lessons of cadence and flow to it. And that actually did get a lot of agents attention because it was a bit strange in that way, but it was not a good book. Uh, this isn't like an overnight success story. Um, in fact, I, that book got an agent, not my current agent, and it went on submission to publishers, which is the next step. It got to the final meeting, the acquisitions meeting at four different publishers over the course of a year, and every single one of them rejected it. So I got like all the way to one foot with it, within the finish line and then got told no. And in retrospect, I can say I'm really glad that book was not my first book because it wasn't the strongest introduction into my career, but it was devastating at the time. I felt like it was grinding me back down. I loved writing and I really hated publishing. And it was pretty much like that rule still stands for me. I really like writing and I have a really hard time with publishing because you go from having all the control to having really none of it. But I was a senior in college, so two years later, when I that fear kicked in again and I thought, if I don't try again, it will have just been a fluke. And I don't want to have let it been a fluke. And I said, I think it's either be one of those things where I'm a very self-aware person. So like I knew it was going to be one of those things where I either sat down and tried to write another book or I walked away for 10 years, 20 years and became one of those people that looked back in my forties and realized I had always wanted to be an author and picked it up again. And that's probably one of the reasons there's such a large age gap between me and some of my contemporaries is simply that I didn't go and have another life first. I made the decision to check out of my studio space because I was an art major at that time. Uh, sixth major. I changed my major a lot. <laughs> I don't <laughs> recommend that, but I was clearly a little restless. And um, I checked out of my studio space for two hours every single night, my second semester, senior year. I walked across the street to a coffee shop. I did not have this time, but I made this time. 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. every night for three months. And I wrote. I decided I was going to write another book. And uh, it was grueling. And some days I would write two or 300 words. And sometimes I would write 2000. But at the end of that semester, I had another book. <laughs> and it was stronger. And it was far from perfect. But it was definitely an improvement. And that book would go on to be the first book that I ever had published. Open Near Witch. And how did it feel when the book actually got published? Um, it was good. It was, it was complicated. I think we build things up in our minds. Like this is going to be the life changing moment. This is going to be the moment where I feel all the things that the rom-com tells me I'm going to feel that the <laughs> feel good movie tells me I'm going to feel. It's never that simple. It's never that simple. You know, um, 
it was a really complicated experience. I was in the midst of having a falling out with my first agent, and my first agency. There was a lot of really mixed emotions, but at the same time, all I could think was, oh my God, I'm going to be a published author. And then and immediately on the heels of that, the fear of, I have to write another book. Because this is the thing. If your first book sells, you're going to need another book. And if your first book doesn't sell, you're going to need another book. And so like the lesson is just like always be moving forward. And so I then had to sit down and do it all again. And I will say as someone who last night finished their first draft of their 16th, what will be their 16th published novel, I'm not sure that for me that has ever gotten easier. The daunting um, nature of the draft that you haven't written yet. I described it to holding up a very large weight that you don't get to sit down until the draft is there. Creation's hard. Yeah. Uh, creation takes a lot of mental energy. It, it it's, does. I think the the brain is three percent of our body weight and take you know a, consumes twenty five percent of our energy. Yeah. It's just a, a very rough process. And well, and I write out of order. And so what that means is I'm legitimately, I'm an outliner, but I write out of order. And so I am truly like holding up a three or four or 500 page novels worth of story in my head and trying, and no matter how many notes I make, just trying not to forget it, not trying, trying not to let any of the spinning plates slip. Speaking of an out of order writer, what's the benefits of that process? Starting with the end. Well, so there are many drawbacks. It's something that I do simply because this is my process and it, it's what works for me. It's yeah. not a process that I, I don't recommend any process over another. This is just how my brain works. But I will say that I don't start writing a book until I know how it ends. And that for me is so important because on good days, it keeps me motivated. Like I can't wait to get to the end because I feel really confident in the ending. And on bad days, it keeps me from giving up because I know that even if there's this chasm, this desert to be crossed, I know what's on the other side of it. And I'm excited for that. So also from a, just a business perspective, look, the end of a story is like the end of a meal. It's the taste left in your mouth. And we as readers will retcon our experience of the rest of the meal to fit. We will retcon the book. We will elevate our rating of the book if we love the ending, and we will dock our rating of the book if we don't like the ending. It's just what sticks with us. And so I really, really firmly believe in having an ending that I feel really confident in and working towards it. So the the ending is where most of your energy spent in the creation process? Uh, no, I mean, it's just the first thing. It's just the part the I thing. cannot start the actual draft until I... And sometimes that means waiting six months, a year, two years, five years to start a project that I have in my head if I just can't find the right ending for it. So that's the qualifier for yeah. when you're going to invest yourself in, into the process. Yeah, it's the ending and then it's enough. It's my connects the, connect the dots. I need to have like five to 10 beats that I'm confident I can execute. And I don't also, I don't always execute them in order, but like five to 10 beats. And because of that, I don't start writing a book until I know I have enough material for it to be a book. And so I don't have any trunk novels. I don't have any novels that I've started and not finished because I don't let myself start until I'm confident that I have enough to make a book. That makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a pretty cool process. Whether it works or not. And there are, I have so many friends. Who <laughs> well, it works for you, right? That's, that's what matters. Well, that's the idea though, is people want, they want a formula. And the fact is, the only thing that works is whatever works for you. There's no right way to do this. And I have friends who they don't plan. I have friends that write meticulously in order and, and never look back. I have friends that don't revise as they write. I have friends that whose creative processes are the exact opposite of mine and it works for them. So like never, like no creative should ever be dissuaded because their process doesn't resemble somebody else. Yeah. I I'm with you. And, and I, I'm a poker coach. I, coach people playing poker and people want heuristics. You know, they want to say, do this, 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 and this, and then I will do that. And I have to say, life is not that easy. <laughs> the, what the process that works for me, um, you know, my other successful poker playing friends have different processes that work for them and my process wouldn't work for them. So you have to experiment, test and find what works for you. And then, you know, be, become married to that 
And I get it. Like we all want a prescriptive process because it gives us hope because it tells us that if we put in that time and we put in that effort, then at the end of the day, we're going to be rewarded. And look, that's not how publishing works. That's how creativity works. You will be rewarded at the end of the day because you will have finished your project. But it's just, I wish it were that simple. I wish I could take away the fear and the doubt that go with it, but I can't. Well, I think, you know, that's part of the barrier to entry to success yeah. too. That's a, a lot of the friction that people have to work their way through that enable them to build a career and, and do things that other people just can't do. It's, it's supposed to be hard. Um, it is. It is. And it's that idea where people get very turned off by rejection. They get very turned off or daunted. And I say, look, like these thresholds are there not only to test if your craft is ready, for the next step, but to test if you as the creator are psychologically ready for the next step. Because if you can't handle, you'd struggle to handle um, putting your work in front of somebody else, how are you going to handle being a published author where the entire idea of your career is that your work is in front of somebody else for public consumption? If you can't handle criticism and critique, how are you going to handle negative reviews? If you can't handle any of these, or if you get turned off by being told no, if you get so easily turned away, then psychologically, emotionally, you are not fit for this process. It's not a good fit. And then I say to people, I'm not telling you to stop writing. By all means, always be a writer, but understand that if you want to be an author, if you want to be a, a creative whose job hinges on the public consumption of your work, there are thresholds that you have to be comfortable crossing. And do you find that, have you ever felt bad for a negative review, negative feedback? Have you, have you ever let it get to you? Um, and is there this inoculation process that I was going to say, it gets easier. It It gets easier. Look, like when I was a debut author, I definitely, I had thinner skin. And the fact of the matter is, and this is a thing I wish I could teach all of my friends who are just coming up. And it's really something you only learn by doing as with many parts of the professional side of this process I have been able to make peace with both positive and negative reviews in the last few years because, look, I have 15 books on shelves right now or on shelves in the next week. Not every one of those books is for everyone, and nobody has to like all of those books equally. And for everyone out there who, who picks up one of my books and it's not for them, I'm able to make peace with that because there's somebody else who picked up my book that desperately needed it. So I think so much of it is coming to peace with the fact that reading is entirely subjective and that your words, your story, your craft is not going to be received equally, but you're not writing it for every single person. If you try to write a project that appeals to everyone, you will end up satisfying no one. And so, in fact, I was able to make peace with it by really narrowing my focus and asking myself, who am I writing for? And the truth was I was writing for a version of myself. And when I started really honing in on that and asking, getting a more specific idea of my audience, it actually broadened my readership a lot. So instead of trying to write to please everyone, write to please yourself. Make sure that you want to read more than anything else what you're writing. And that's like one of the first big steps. And so now it's like I have readers who love Vicious so much more than Darker Shade of Magic and readers who love A Darker Shade of Magic so much more than The Savage Song. And that's that's fine. I don't need every one of my books to be received the same way by the same readers. I want them to find the readers that need. And with every book that's ever been made, but you know, Harry Potter, there are people that hated Harry Potter, yeah. you know, it, they're like it, you're not, you can never make something that resonates with everybody. And I love, I love the secret weapon there. You're writing books for you. Yeah. because it's really easy to do market research on you. Yeah, <laughs> you, have, exactly. you have a lot of inside knowledge into what you love and what you're going to enjoy reading. It's also really freeing because it's the only way to guarantee that you're not disappointed in the process. If you spend a year or two years writing a book that's not for you, that's for somebody else, and that book doesn't get published or it doesn't do well or it doesn't hit its mark, you now feel like you've wasted time. But if you make sure that you're the primary audience for that book, then that book will, in your own mind, never have been a waste. Would you suggest people who are endeavoring a career writing stories, would you suggest that everybody looks at it that, that same way? Or I, I guess everybody, okay, no heuristics. Yeah, mo no heuristics. Mo most people look at it writing for themselves as a more fulfilling way to yes. go about the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether you are writing for a specific version of yourself or whether you are writing for yourself and that you are writing something that you specifically want to read, 
I think it is one of the only ways to maintain sanity in this industry. That's awesome, awesome feedback. And I, yeah. I hope that if there's somebody out there that's trying to write to market and write to an audience that's not themselves, you know, consider that, that, that feedback because I think it's very, very valuable. Okay, so we'll go back in your story. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to your, getting the book published. Mm-hmm. Um, could you tell me about the limited expectations, uh, the terms of you know, the first deal that you had and how you felt about that from a creative standpoint? Well, I think it's just kind of shell-shocking because one, I was 22, so I was pretty young. Two, I had no idea what I was doing or what to expect, and there was a lot less transparency. One of the reasons I've tried to be so transparent online and talking about the industry and expectations and feelings of inadequacy and hope and fear is because there was almost none of that when I was kind of just starting out. And the fact is that we have a fetishization of the debut author and of the debut novel in this industry. So... we put a huge amount of pressure on a debut author and on a debut novel. And I always say that we would never do this in any other industry. You would never like be like, you have a debut surgeon today. You should be so <laughs> excited. You'll be his first ever surgery or her first ever surgery. Like we would never be like, oh yay, that's <laughs> great. Give me that untested doctor. But like we do this to, to debuts and it's a disservice to them and it's unfair in so many ways because publishing inflates the debut so that like regardless of how little money you were given, how little marketing you're given, you still harbor this hope that you're going to be like the book that changes everything because that's what they tell you you might be. The fact is that for 99% of debuts, it's not going to be your first book that helps make your career. It's not even going to be your second or your third sometimes. Sometimes it's not going to be any one novel that makes your career. It's going to be the the amalgamation. It's going to be the backlist. Like my book that made me a quote unquote an overnight success was my eighth novel, A Darker Shade of Magic. And I was amazed when so many people were like, oh, this author who just like came out of nowhere. And I was like, I've been here. Like I've been doing this. But um, so I think I was really young in a lot of ways. And The Near Witch was really quiet. I mean, here's the thing. That first book went out of print less than two years after it came out. So it had no chance. I had no chance, and I didn't have a backlist. And so I actually struggled so much more, as many, many creatives do, with their second novel. Because it's your first one for the vast majority of us. It's the first one you're writing under contract. So you go from having an infinite amount of time to write your first book. Maybe it took you a year, maybe it took you five years or 10 years, but you were operating only on your schedule to suddenly you get a second book deal if you're lucky and they, now you're writing under contract and they say, great, you have six months to turn in your first draft. Well, you don't know if you can write a book in six months because you've never had to, even if you wrote your first book in less than six months. So all of a sudden you go from writing and creating within an opaque sphere to writing and creating in a glass bubble. And it's very scary and it's very disorienting. And now there's expectation. And now maybe your first book is also getting reviews. And now instead of just one voice in your head, there's a hundred voices in your head and it can be really debilitating. So I would say I struggled a lot with those opening years of my career. And things were complicated by the fact that um, my second book was the first in what was supposed to be a trilogy. My trilogy was canceled after the second book because my editor left and I was given another editor and I didn't have in-house support and I became a publishing orphan. And then I started to lose my love of the creative process. And so Vicious is actually my fourth book is the one I sat down to write just for myself. It's the very first time I asked myself that question of who am I writing for? If I take publishing away from it, if I stop trying to please other people and I now I've been exposed over the course of three books to the fact that so much of it is out of my control and it's a kind of can be a really miserable process. I'm just going to write for me. And that way, if vicious never gets published, at least I'll remind myself that I like creating, you know? And so vicious in many ways, uh, my first adult novel would go on to be like the novel that changed the entire tide and direction of my career. So, but it only happened. It only ever happened because I wanted to fall back in love with writing. And I started asking myself those questions about audience. Hey there, all you loyal 
the Process Podcast listeners. I just wanted to take a moment to talk to you about a book that I created earlier this year called A Thoughtful Gift, Reflections on Our Love. And I created it because I want to do my part in helping people fully express their love for one another. It's something that gives me joy and fulfillment in my own life. And I have to admit that as I created the pages and had them illustrated, and when I held this tangible thing I had made from my brain in my hands, I ha- had some skepticism as to whether or not it would do what I wanted it to do. Maybe skepticism is the wrong word. I, I had some fear, some anxiety over it. So my wife and I, we sat down together. We went through the book, and I have to say that I did a pretty damn good job. It was just an amazing night spent with her, exploring how we'd given each other strength, how we'd shown each other love, what we've helped one another overcome, and it allowed us to verbally express some things that maybe we had kept inside, maybe things that don't come up organically. And I have very, very, very happy memories making that book with her, and I just looked back through it and it made me smile. It just did the things that I wanted it to do when I I had the initial idea. So because A Thoughtful Gift is my baby and it was built specifically to increase the intimacy of the most important relationship in your life, if you buy the book and you aren't more than satisfied, I demand that you ask for a refund I don't want to (laughs) hoodwink you by any stretch of the imagination. I think that it'll be an amazing night that gives you happy memories for many years to come. And if it's not that, if it's not everything that I'm saying it will be, here, have your money back. If you're not happy, I'm not happy. So to buy A Thoughtful Gift, you can head to a thoughtfulgiftbook.com. There's also a link on mentallyinvincible.com, but primarily a thoughtful gift book.com. Now back to the show. What is it about superheroes and the villains? Why, why did the audience of Victoria's cheer for that book? I don't know. I just, so it started out for me as a creative exercise. I, I tried to ch- challenge myself with each and every book to do something different. And with vicious, I wanted to see if I could write a book with absolutely no heroes and make you root for one of them anyway. Like make you root for one of these really terrible people. (laughs) And so I just like, it started as an, as a craft exercise and I really like villains. I like that. I think they're, they have a lot more interesting moral grays than a lot of classic heroes. And I was really interested in like, comic book culture, like the way that things are drawn into black and whites. And I was like, what if we just take all the black and white away? Like, what if I just make everyone kind of bad and kind of self-interested and make it so that superpowers don't make you a superhero. They just make you a kind of a worse person who now has the ability to act out on all of your petty hatreds. And I think it was like, people really liked being able to live vicariously through these characters and being able to act out those revenges and those petty feelings and be in control and get to be a little bit bad. There's something about that book that people go through an almost moral crisis while reading it because they pick it up and they're like, wow, Victor and Eli are really bad people. Like they're terrible and I don't like either one of them. And then by about the halfway mark, they're like, okay, these guys are really terrible, but I kind of get what Victor's <laughs> doing. And then three quarters of them, I, they're like, okay, what does it say about me that like, I really like Victor and I don't know what that, and then they finish the book and they're like, okay, I am team Victor and I don't even care. And I watch them over and over. Every single reader goes through some version of a moral crisis. And I love that. And I think they love it too, because it starts to open their minds in a really different way. It starts to make them wonder, why did I like that thing? You know, that, that was my experience too. I'm (laughs) I'm reading it and and this stuff happens with Victor and I'm like, Oh, Victor's an asshole. Like, like, and then, and it, but it hasn't spent too much time with Eli. And I'm thinking, well, I'm like, maybe I'm just being tricked here. And you know, (laughs) Victor's the asshole and Eli is going to turn out to be the okay one. And then you read about him and you're like, no, this dude, this is not a good guy either. Like I actually, if I have to choose, (laughs) you know, I'm going with Victor. Um, And then by the end, you're like, you, your team Victor. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, 
you can't really help it. And there's a lot of people who are very much waiting for the next story. Yeah, it's overwhelming. It's daunting. I um, Anyone who follows me online knows that I, Vengeful comes out as we're filming this in a week, which is terrifying. Um, but I rewrote Vengeful from scratch at the very beginning of this year, which is not a thing I would ever recommend doing for anyone. I essentially turned in, uh, there's a five-year gap between Vicious and Vengeful, both publication and in book. And I turned in my draft of Vengeful um, late December of last year, late December of 2017. And a couple days later, my editor called me, never a good sign. And she said, Victoria, this is my editor who I did the entire Shades of Magic series with as well, and Vicious. And she said, this is a really good book. Like, it's a really good book. She's like, and if you had turned it into me two years ago, I would have said, let's publish it as is. Like, it's that strong. She says, you have grown more in the last two years than this book has. And she's like, and now you have a choice. And she's like, I'm not going to make that choice for you. This is your choice. She's like, what you've turned into me is a direct continuation of Vicious. It's just basically Vicious Part 2. She's like, you've always said that you never feel like you want a sequel to just be a continuation. And she's like, and what you have here is a continuation. And there's going to be a lot of readers who are very satisfied with that. But you also, what you have here is the bones of something that could be so much bigger. And she's like, this is your choice. She says, it's a really hard choice to make. And she's like, but you have like, she's like, I don't know that you're going to look back in 10 years and be as proud of vengeful in this state as you are of vicious. And so I scrapped the entire book and we set out to find the right version of the story. And I rewrote 115,000 words from scratch in just over two months. And uh, it nearly broke me, like it nearly destroyed, it destroyed every shred of confidence that I had in my own creative process. Because like I say, the hardest part of this entire endeavor was that the original version was good. It just wasn't extraordinary. <laughs> and I wanted it to be. And so I, have, I can safely say there will be people out there who don't like Vengeful. There are people out there who don't like any book of mine or this will be the book that they don't like. I, again, those things are out of my control. But what I can safely say is that I have never been prouder of anything that I have done. How does it feel to have somebody care that much about you as a person to say, you know, this is great, but, you know, I think you're capable of more. I'm grateful in retrospect and terrible at the time because, like, it's such a, it's such a, not a backhanded compliment because there's really no negative to it. It's just so hard to hear especially because it's the choice was mine. She's like, look, I'm going to stand by you and I'm going to support you no matter which version of this book we put out. She's like, but I think you can do more. And I know there, you know what, there are some authors out there who would say, yeah, you're probably right, but I don't feel like rewriting a book from scratch. So let's keep the way it is. She knew me well enough to know that like, I have to be so proud of a product to put it out. Like it can't even just be good enough. Like for me, good enough are the two worst words in the creative arsenal. Uh, I wanted it to be the best it could be. And, and I'm so lucky to have retrospect now to be able to be far enough from it and to have um, it coming out and to have some early readers now just finally like starting and finishing it and to see that feedback, which they're now saying, this is my favorite of all of your books. This is like Lila Bard, who is for many, like their favorite female character in all of my books for many of them is now becoming Marcella Riggins, who's the villainess of um, of Vengeful. And it's really heartening. If you had asked me four months ago, obviously, like I wouldn't have had the hindsight. I wouldn't have been able to give that answer. And so honestly, Miriam, my editor, she was really demanding a lot of faith. She was asking me if I trusted in her and in us enough to do that process. But I will say also it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It is not to be underestimated. Um, I'm so, so glad I did it, but I'm still kind of tired from it. Like that was the first half of my year and I feel like I have not recovered. I'm actually really looking forward to going on tour because I think of all of my book tours, this one's going to be kind of a celebration. It's going to be a celebration of what this book finally became. Yeah. I I can't imagine going through that, uh, having to redo everything. Are you grateful that you did do it, that you put yourself through it and that it, that it's done? Um, I'm grateful it's done. (laughs) Like, God help me. I'm grateful it's done. Yes, I have zero regrets. I have zero regrets. And I think, again, then that experience adds to my arsenal. And then next time I'm posed, like next, next time I'm faced with such a difficult choice, I will know, 
like, because I had a moment of hesitation. I had a couple days there where I was genuinely like lying on the floor, crying, asking myself, like, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And I look, I hit points in there even after I decided it was worth it, where I hit one night where I just was like, fuck it. Oh, you'll have to believe me. No, I don't care. <laughs> like, I'll have to give, I'm just going to give the money back. Like, I'm just going to give the advance back and we're just not going to do this book because I, I felt it felt insurmountable. Um, but I am so glad that I did it. I'm so grateful that I did it. This obviously makes me want to read Vengeful that much more. <laughs> and I think that the reception, I mean, it's a sequel. So you would think that the feedback's probably going to be pretty positive if people have made it through the first book and are reading the second book. I guess you would be surprised, but... Um, it's a very different book. It's definitely a book in conversation with the first book. Like, So I'm going to be really, really interested. Why put yourself through this. You changed majors five times in college, yeah. right? Yeah. Why, why deal with the suffering and the pain? <laughs> you mean of writing? Of writing and going through this creative process and, and crying and, and all these things. Why do you still have it in you to keep moving forward? I honestly think that writing, it, it keeps me sane. Like I have a lot of, um, a lot of circ- Cutest thoughts. I have, I struggle with mental health. I struggle with sanity and I struggle with um, staying balanced and staying grounded. And as maddening and frustrating as writing can be for me and as adversarial relationship as I have with it compared to some of my friends for whom it just seems joyful. The fact of the matter is uh, if I'm not writing, I don't feel well. If I'm not writing, there's all of this empty space that worse thoughts can take up. And writing is all almost the way of me giving my brain something to do that's proactive, giving my brain something to do that's like a a focus and a course. And so it comes down to the fact that like, I write because I have to, I write because even if it weren't my job, I would do it to keep myself, myself and to keep myself grounded. And on top of that, look, like I love thinking up stories. I love making things up. I love getting to create from scratch. My favorite parts of the process are that brainstorming part before I start writing. And that last revision, when I finally start reading it as a reader instead of a writer, everything in between is terrible. And like, I have to be dragged through the drafts and the revisions, but it's all worth it for me for the brainstorming at the beginning and for the final iteration at the end. The problem is that as many of my friends and family point out, um, I have this like weird short term memory where I don't have children, but I've been told it's like pregnancy where if you remembered it accurately, you would never do it again. And like, so I finish a book and then I retcon my experience so that it wasn't as bad. And so then I have this circuitous process where I constantly like, my other books were never this hard and I'm broken now. And all of my friends and family are like, let me show you the receipts from the same email you sent like seven months ago, a year ago, two years ago. And they go back and back and back. So I do wish I could remember a little more accurately. But no, I write because I, I need it. Victoria, I, I, I appreciate your vulnerability a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the truth from my perspective is that, you know, you're doing a lot of good. You're a lot of kids or a lot of people are reading your books and they're forgetting the problems and the things that overwhelm them in their own life. And it's, it's, yeah, it's such a generous thing to give to the world. Well, thank you. It feels very selfish at the same time, because like I say, I need it too. (laughs) I need, I, I, um, I jokingly say when I go on tour, people are like, do you mind signing this? And I'm like, I love signing shit because it means I'm not writing it anymore. <laughs> but like, I need the creative process too. And, and I, you know, I'm, I am one of those people where I, I would write if, even if I weren't published, but I'm so, so grateful that I get to do this and have this be my job and that I get, writing is very solitary, but I am so grateful to have an audience now at this point that communicates with me so constantly and bolsters me up on good days and on bad and really is just feels like a family, like a community. I don't, I don't like referring to readers as fans because of that, because I feel like they're there for me in the way that I'm there for them. And I do feel like, especially in darker times, it's so important. 
I try to write two kinds of escape. I write escape like Shades of Magic, which is like, get me the hell out of this world. I just want to live somewhere that makes me feel like Hogwarts, where like you wanted to return. And then I write the kind of escape like this savage song and like Vicious and Vengeful, which are a bit more about empowerment, a bit more about making the readers feel like even for a little while while they're living those lives, they're living in a world where they can fight those demons, where they have the strength and the ability and the power to tackle things they might not in their own world. I, I love that. You're, you're doing such a great job. And, well, thank you. Um, I guess I just want to go back and ask you about Neil Gaiman. You yeah. said that he made you a writer. What yeah. did, how did he affect your career? Well, so the thing is, I was probably 15 or 16, and I was really, I knew I wanted to be a storyteller, and I had no idea what shape that would take. I was doing poetry and short fiction mostly, and I felt like, that, as many teenagers feel, there was a huge amount of pressure for me to pick a lane, like pick what I was going to be, who I was going to be. And I felt very pressured because I didn't want to choose. I thought, well, what if I, I'm making a commitment and then I, I change, like, what if I also want to do this? It wasn't like, what if I change my mind? It was like, why do I have to pick one avenue for creativity? We're both, we're both Tennesseans. Yeah. And, and I think from that part of the world, there is that pressure. Oh, absolutely. Do one thing, be a certain way, believe a certain thing. Yeah. And stay in that bubble. And but I was, I found Neil's work when I was a teenager. And this is a man who, he had comics he had novels, he had short fiction, he had poems, he had screenplays, he had essays, he had songs. Every single thing he wrote had his voice all over it, but they weren't bound by format. And I thought, oh my God, like I can do that. Like he was the one that made me realize that I didn't have to choose as long as I could write in a way that my voice permeated everything I did then I would be able to do whatever I wanted. And so it was probably, it's one of those things of a revelation hitting you at exactly the time you need it, of being 16 and realizing, like it was just like the doors being blown open on an idea where I realized, oh my God, I, I don't have to pick. Like I can keep telling these stories and I can tell them in a strange um, broad ways as possible. And I've been really fortunate. Um, I've now met Neil several times. He's gone on to be a kind of mentor and friend. And like, I, I wear this bracelet, this one of those little rubber bracelets that says WWNGD, what would Neil Gaiman do? And like, I've worn it for more than a decade. You know, I met Neil for the first time like eight, seven years ago, but I, I've worn it for more than a decade. I, I still credit him with so much of my inspiration and drive. I wrote him a an open letter when my debut novel came out called The Planet from the Speck. Just this about this idea of like when you look at somebody who has so much mass and so much energy and you feel like you're just this tiny speck in orbit. Like how do you, how do you, people like we technically are in the same profession and yet you feel so inadequate to that comparison and how do you gain gravity and mass? And, and it's one of those things where, he has continued to be one of the most important figures in my career. Is there, is there anything about being that tiny speck that maybe you weren't grateful for then, but you're grateful for now? No, I, I truly believe that I have many, many flaws and I have had many shortcomings, but being grateful isn't one of them. I have been grateful every single day that I have had this job. Awesome. Awesome. So have you ever strongly believed something in, in life, it doesn't have to be necessarily yeah. related to writing, only to change your mind, reverse course later on. And if so, what led to that change? I grew up wanting everyone to like me. And probably one of the best things I figured out when I hit like 30 was that like, you're like the same way you're never going to write a book that pleases everyone. You're never going to, you can't make everyone like you. Like there are just always going to be people out there who don't like you. And sometimes they're going to have valid reasons from their perspective. And sometimes they're not going to have valid reasons and taking on the weight of other people's judgment is one of the most useless and exhausting things that you can do. So I went from expending a huge amount of my energy trying to fit in specifically in publishing, trying to make all of those political friendships that you're supposed to make, trying to make sure you have, you know, a table to sit at in the metaphorical cafeteria to just trusting that I would find the right people 
And it was when I let go of this need to try and please everyone, this need to try and be liked. And people, of course, would still not like me. It would reach me, word would reach me that someone didn't like me. And I would feel like I had no idea why they didn't like me. And the fact is, it didn't matter. They don't like you. Not everyone will. And so stop wasting energy on making other people like you and like focus on making sure that you're happy and that you're receptive and open to making those more genuine friendships. There's so much vulnerability that you have that you have when you publish and you put yeah. something out there because it's really easy for people to be shitty. It's really oh, easy yeah. for people to tear you down. And, it, and it's hard because you put so much of yourself, you suffer so yeah. much love, so much energy. Um, and we're cursed with a negativity bias that makes, you know, that, that one negative comment stand out oh, so much. You can have a um, hundred great reviews and you get like one, one star review. And that's the one that you dwell on forever. Like that's <laughs> the one that just follows you around this little earworm in your head all day. But yeah, I just think it's so important to try and, and just like come to terms with that. And some of that's just adulthood. <laughs> And yeah. some of that's just maturity and just try hoping that you find a good, a good group and understanding that like your friendship, especially in an industry where it's creative and business intertwined, like your friendship circles are going to shift over time. They're going to flex and adjust and sometimes shrink. And that's okay. Like, I think when we're growing up, we have this obsession with quantity. And as you get older, it becomes qualitative instead. Yeah, I think we can only maintain a certain number of friendships, especially at a at a very close level. And yeah. sometimes those relationships, uh, in my case, and uh, another guy that I interviewed, Bob Babinski, yeah. when I asked him that question, he he said that he had a dog and the dog uh-huh. passed passed away. And and he, what he learned was that you could love animals more than people. Yeah. And you know, in my life, we we have animals that are in our house. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, one of them passed away yesterday, and we loved him. We, yeah. you know, we loved him. I, I loved him more than most most people, and that's yeah. a strange thing to say. Um, I don't but, think it's that strange. I think I think I mean I, I say that as someone who's always seen animals as family. Like, and and yeah, I just think broadening your mind into like what constitutes friendship, what constitutes family, what our demands and expectations are, what our needs are. A lot of it comes down to just being very self-aware. Yeah. Okay. So if you could share one truth with the world, what would that truth be? I have no idea. Like I would keep it secret. I'm a Slytherin. Like I wouldn't share, like if I knew the truth, but I feel like what we were just talking about kind of almost goes into that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just learn to like find peace with the fact that you can't please everyone. Within all of this, um, you know, the, your process and the struggles and all of these things, do you have anything that you practice regularly for self-care? Any habits, rituals? I do yoga. I do a lot of yoga. I mean, obviously for me, physical well-being and mental well-being are very closely tied. Like I, I take antidepressants and they work a hell of a lot better when you are, have a metabolic level. And so for me, like I've just learned, and this isn't true for everyone. And obviously some people have uh, hurdles to physical well being that I don't, but um, I really, really rely on physical activity and physical wellness for mental health. How do you carve out time when you're, you're on the road, you're, you're traveling to practice that self-care? It's not easy. In fact, one of the most frustrating things is I was a I was a long distance swimmer for more than a decade. I would swim an hour and a half to two hours at a time. Like and pools are not something I have easy access to. And so I have not been able and it's something I beat myself up for and then I have to stop and kind of like step back and realize that like my wellness is gonna have to take different forms when I travel and that's not a bad thing. And so I I don't necessarily get to work out in the exact way that I want to work out, but hey man, hotel gyms and yoga mats on hotel floors. Like I, you can do yoga in, for 20 minutes and it will have so much benefit. I do one that's like, I use yoga with Adrienne, which is on YouTube mm-hmm. and she does ones for um, digestion and for anxiety and for stretching. And when you spend a lot of time on airplanes, these things are very, very helpful. Awesome. Uh, one of my guests, Adam Creek, he's an Olympic champion mm-hmm. rower. 
he uh he told me he he speaks he's a keynote speaker he travels and speaks yeah. and he classifies himself as big and lazy um because of course you know you're yeah. an olympic olympic level athlete of course of course, of, you're course. Lazy. of course you're lazy right but he um one of the tricks that he does and i don't suggest you do this because mm-hmm. <laughs> there, yeah. there would be thousands of people but he tells the speakers at the conferences he goes to hey so not only do you get a speaker yeah. you also get a personal trainer for free <laughs> yeah. i lead a, i lead a session at 8 a.m and tell everybody yeah so, you know if they want a personal training session at eight show up so then he's in he's he has accountability. No, yeah he, he created the social accountability he has no choice but to show up at yeah. that point see i'm um, the exact opposite of because like i for me alone time when i'm traveling is like so precious for me i exercise like that's my time to be alone it's a meditative thing when i was long distance swimming it was very meditative because you're yeah. essentially swimming you know, 80 to 100 laps. And uh, that's very, that's very solitary. And so you, it becomes meditative. I am definitely not a team player when it comes to exercise. Like I'll go to a workout class and that guilts me into like not quitting. But for me so much, like I'm about to go to the gym after this call and it's just going to be about like finding centering. I listen to an audio book or a podcast and I just like, I just try to find some, like, that's the only self-care time I can carve out some days. And so it's really important to look at exercise, for me anyway, not something I have to do, not a chore, but it's like this very precious hour to hour and a half that I'm giving myself. It's, it, kind of, it goes back to, you know, the process of what works for each of us. And exactly. it's, it's, it's all different. Um, do you have any books that, that you do reread every few years? <gasps> I almost never reread. And really? I know I'm like, I, I know this is like a very contentious topic. Like some people <laughs> really? swear by rereading. Yeah. I, I try to read about a hundred books a year um, because I consider Holy it part of my job. Well, I consider yeah. it part of my job. I think that to be a, um, an active and prolific author, you really need to understand what else is being made. You need to understand the conversation that your work is a part of. And also you just need to cross pollinate. Like creatively, I can only write as much as I write because I'm constantly refilling my creative well. And so for me, writing, like reading is absolutely essential. I feel like I gained the the year, which was, I guess, three years ago that I decided I was going to start read, like set this goal of a hundred books a year. My quality in my drafts went up exponentially. Wow. So I'm glad that I asked that question because it's, that's huge, yeah. huge for people who are aspiring writers. Um, yes. You don't need a graduate school program. You don't need like, all, I mean, it's fine. I'm sure you have many listeners who have those things and those are great, but you don't need those things. What you need is to be an active reader and absorber, and you need to be able to read and watch TV and movies and comics and do these things and absorb a multitude of narrative. And examine it as a re-editor, as a writer. Like, start looking at what works. When you read something you don't like, start looking at why you don't like it. When you read or watch something that feels like it has a very satisfying pace or arc, start asking yourself why. So I don't reread books, but I rewatch movies because it's, it's an easier window of time for me. And so I will rewatch a movie if I liked it the first time. And then I'll watch it the first time as just like a viewer. And I'll watch it the second time as a writer. And I'll start breaking down the dialogue. I'll start breaking down the pacing as I'm watching it and just start eating those things into my creative well, like into the algorithm in my head of like trying to create an intuitive sense for myself of what works. And I do that so that when I sit down to write, I have a pretty good intuitive sense when I'm writing. If I hit a place where I'm like, "Eh," like the pacing here is weird. Why do I know the pacing is weird? Because I have this thousand you know, item catalog in my head of things that work. And it's just created a strong intuitive sense for me of when something doesn't work. That's gold right there. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. It, I, I do the same thing. And a lot of times it makes me hate myself. Yeah. Um, I listen to podcasts and I ask, why, did, why does this resonate with people? Why mm-hmm. is this so great? And then I start breaking it down and thinking like, oh, I get it now. And then I'm like, oh, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I think of that? I, I wish I could go back in time and do better. <laughs> The fact that we have so much education at our fingertips then as creatives, like I'm always, my, it boggles my mind when I talk to writers who don't read. More, more so than at any other time in human history do yeah. we have access. Or that don't like, they're like, man, I just don't really, like, I don't really do it. And I'm like, how? that makes me very concerned for your writing. 
because what that Are tells they successful? me is that, well, some of them, but also what it tells me is they have no creative cross pollination or they only read in their genre. And I'm thinking what an incestuous way to create that you're only pulling creatively. You're only absorbing stories you already know, formats that have already been told, archetypes that have already been written and explored, almost no um, perpendiculars to your parallels. Like you, uh, you have to explore these things so that you understand how to subvert, how to change, how to shift narratives. And so when I read, when I talk to like male fantasy authors who only read like fantasy and I guarantee you 99% of it's by other like white male fantasy authors. I, all I'm thinking is like, I can tell when I read your books that you're not a, you're not drawing from anywhere else. And what a shallow well to draw from. Yeah. That, and it really, it's not only, a, it, it, it's a disservice to yourself and, and probably the readers as well, yeah. you know, that they don't get to experience all of these different things. Well, I'm like, I, I read as much nonfiction as fiction. I listen to a ton of memoirs. And one of the reasons I, and I love memoirs, especially like actor memoirs and author memoirs, like other creative individuals. But one of the reasons I love memoirs is because, especially autobiographical ones, as an author, so much of what I do is studying character, like what makes a person. And when you listen to or read a memoir, you are being given a capsule of a character. You're being given an entire life. And to me, it's just one of those things of, again, I'm filling that well of what makes a person. Like all these pieces, all of these memories and ideas and things that stand out for them. So I used to call that a guilty pleasure. Now I don't because I don't believe any form of narrative consumption is should be guilty. That creates a value statement. But like I absolutely, as a creative person, highly recommend um, podcasts, shows, but a lot of nonfiction as well, because it gives you that insight into people. And what you're trying to do as a fiction writer is create people from scratch. I, I absolutely love that that perspective because you're you're getting depth. Um, mm-hmm. You're you're understanding deeply about other people. Yeah, and, and I think the last thing I'd apply. say is that like. I often my readers tend to like my secondary characters a lot. And and the, I think one of the reasons that is, is because whether I have a character appearing as a main character or only showing up for a couple pages of an entire book, my, the rule I set for myself is that character has to have enough story that if I pulled them out of the narrative and gave them their own book, they could be the protagonist. So that means you might only meet a character for like one paragraph, but I still have to know enough about that character that they could have a book. And I think it's one of the, it's the iceberg syndrome, but I think as a reader, even if I don't show you more, I've just shown you enough that you know there is more to this character that they don't feel cardboard. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome, awesome in the creative process. <laughs> and um, I know that you're going to go exercise, practice yeah. some self-care. Um, final thing, where yes. can everybody find you on the interwebs? Oh, I live inside the internet, which is no surprise these days. Um, The easiest places to find me or the best places to find me are Twitter and Instagram. Um, They're both just V.E. Schwab, all one word, V-E-S-C-H-W-A-B. Very simple. Um, I am clearly addicted to both platforms given how much I post, but I do try to post a lot of writing advice and a lot of like insights into the creative process. And you're a giver. And I think that (laughs) anybody that, spends time reading your works reading your twitter reading your instagram listening to this podcast will you know that'll shine through well thank you so much thank you next time on the process podcast we have international best-selling author psychotherapist and oprah winfrey regular jonathan robinson so my books have largely been a description of what the best minds on the planet are doing to create more love and more peace in their life. Some of them didn't work for me. Some of them worked amazingly well. Like the thank you method, originally I said, well, that's a bunch of BS. Like, I, what, you know, I just wasted several thousand dollars in a week. Well, in actuality, I like a five second method that I can do 10 times a day. That really has an impact. <laughs>